this welcome everybody recording is in progress you're all being i'm being recorded um uh welcome to day two um we've got some really exciting talks um three talks and then there's um a discussion the speaker uh alejandro Guse, i don't know how to pronounce his surname Kuche. Kose. Kose. okay um unfortunately cannot make it um so um we were planning to have um a block of time where everyone who signed in gets to introduce themselves and talk briefly about uh what they do and whether there's anyone else present at the meeting who they'd like to meet we thought there are there are two ways there are two types of thing that happen i think when i'm in a conference one is that there's someone who i think is really interesting to meet but i haven't got anything uh anything concrete to say and so it's a bit embarrassing but i want to meet them uh, and the other thing is there's someone specific who i want to meet and meet and ask a specific question um so um i think in that break we're going to go around through everyone who's willing to do it just to introduce themselves and if there is someone else who they uh want to meet um either to say something specific or just because they'd like to meet them then you could announce it then and then people can organize uh individual meetings as and when they like um but anyway can i say moment, one thing yeah uh, uh, matteo suggested that uh, since some people may not want to talk to say anything uh, the people who want to talk just leave the the camera on in that moment not now so that yeah. we know when we don't bother people who don't want to. yeah that sounds good that way we won't chase people okay yeah. Um, so I'll start with the first talk. This is Will Matlock from University of Oxford, um, talking about plasma distributions in human bloodstream infection associated and non-human enterobacteriales in Oxfordshire, UK, dem demonstrating sharing across reservoirs. Will, are, are you online? I am, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, brilliant. You, uh, let's share. Oh, there you are. You are sharing screen already. Go. Amazing. Um, yes. Thank you so much for having me. Let me minimise everyone's faces. There we go. Um, yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, today, I want to give an overview of a current study in progress, um, which is looking at the overlap between human and, and non-human enterobacterialis plasmids. Um, and I really hope this talk gives some insight in, into One Health for AMR. We have Tim Walsh's figure there. Um, One Health for AMR from a plasmid, plasmid perspective. Um, so to begin, um, our ambition was, was to try and unpick the dynamics of, of plasmid sharing across human and non-human compartments. Um, plasmids, as, as was discussed in depth yesterday, often carry clinically important antibiotic resistance genes. Um, so understanding their, their evolutionary histories is crucial to managing resistance as a whole. Um, and existing studies have, have started to unpick plasmid sharing, but often are um, limited in size, given the, the genetic diversity in these niches. Um, restricted to single species or phenotypes, for instance, drug resistant isolates, um, and have not fully evaluated the, the dissemination of MGEs, such as plasmids, as we're talking about here, or, or insertion sequences. Um, and this is often due to, to fragmented genome assemblies. And there was also some discussion yesterday on, on, on assembly techniques for, for plasmids. Um, so to address previous limitations and, and better explore um, enterobacterialis plasmid diversity and, and sharing across compartments. We assemble both a geographically and temporally restricted sample to investigate two avenues, um, which I want to talk about today. Um, so the first of which is, is how are identical plasmids shared between compartments? Uh, and the second component is how is broader plasmid evolution history playing out between compartments? Um, and the main emphasis here is on human and non-human sampling, which is, of course, um, of clinical interest. So the data set itself comprises of, of large isolate collections from human bloodstream infections from 08 to 18, um, and from longitudinal sampling from the rehab project, which includes livestock, uh, environmental soils, wastewater, and, and the waterways kind of surrounding wastewater treatment works. And this totaled um, quite a hefty data set of around one and a half thousand complete enterobacterialis genomes, meaning both the chromosome and all the plasmids are circularized. Um, and indeed that included over three and a half thousand circularized plasmids from this restricted data set. And briefly, the genomes were unicycular hybrid assemblies, 
So we were using Illumina, PED and short reads, um, and then either PAC bio or, or nanopore long reads. So ideally this will capture both the global synteny, uh, the gene ordering of the plasmids alongside a high quality nucleotide resolution, which of course you need for things like um, determining ARG alleles and so on. Um, so to begin with the most simple approach, uh, this was pulling sets, out sets of plasmids from the data set within a very conservative, conservative mash threshold um, and a generous sketch size. Um, and this revealed, this plot at the top, um, revealed that most compartmental overlap of near identical plasmids came from the smaller, often well-conserved coal types. So we see this axis here is increasing in length and towards the left-hand side, we have these um, compartmental breakdowns of the various identical plasmids, um, blue, uh, the BSIs, green, the environments, red, the livestocks, uh, and, and purple, uh, a combination of waterways and, and, and wastewater. Um, and then as we move rightward, we often see kind of longer, uh, often resistant and conjugative plasmid sets, which what these bars below indicate. Um, but we also see more segregation between human and non-human compartments. Um, if perhaps greatest interest here uh, are these two conjugative F-type plasmids, this little bar below the red arrow, um, carrying multi-drug resistance efflux pumps, uh, both in E. coli ST54, and they were found in a cattle and a BSI isolate. Uh, and I'll come back to these later. Um, but overall, the general message is there isn't much overlap of, of identical plasmids. Um, but of course, again, as, as was discussed in depth yesterday, um, plasmid evolution is far from vertical. Um, and taken together, the action of, of other MGEs, recombination, co-integration, and other such events, uh, plasmids evolve in, in highly complex dynamics. And a lot of these changes take place within a well-conserved plasmic backbone. Um, I have a quote there from Alex Orlick's brilliant 2018 paper. Um, and what we often see within plasmids is, is sets of core genes with this well-conserved synteny uh, within which accessory genes come and go. So what we really need to do is look beyond identical sharing to understand how compartmentalized or segregated plasmid evolution truly is uh, within our sample. Um, so for those interested to kind of briefly summarize our, our methodology for the second step, um, we began by clustering the plasmids uh, by the Jack in, Jacquard index of their KMA content, uh, 21 MA content, um, using MASH with a generous sketch size of, of, of a million. These were then clustered with the Levain algorithm, uh, which I believe was also mentioned yesterday within a plasmid plasmid network. Uh, we then annotated our plasmids with, with Proca, which uses Prodigal, uh, an abricot with, with various databases, including, including Plasmid Finder. Um, and where this is all going to end up uh, is examining the plasmid clustered core gene phylogenies generated with Panaru to pull out our, our core genes and then IQ tree to generate the phylogenies. Um, so visualized here uh, is the quite an unwieldy looking network, but this, this is our weighted Jacquard similarity plasmid network. Um, threshold at a similarity of 0.5. So what this means in practice is any two plasmids within this network are connected, share at least 50% of their mutual 21mers. Uh, and briefly, because um, I know we have a lot of plasmid networky type people here, um, that threshold was chosen by examining the, 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 the component evolution of the network as we stripped away edges. Um, and again, colored within the same uh, compartmental color scheme, we immediately see some cross compartmental uh, genetic sharing. Uh, and that's really what we wanted to explore further. Um, so as I mentioned, we then clustered the data set. We, we segregated our plasmids into, into 247 clusters of at least three plasmids using the Levain algorithm. And they're shown here in varying colors. Um, and by doing this, we found around 30% of our clusters contained both human, our BSI, uh, and non-human livestock or environmental plasmids. Um, and as an aside here, um, in terms of, of antimicrobial resistance, the focus of this week. I, I've over-exaggerated them um, for, for super clarity here in red. Um, and in terms of clusters, we found plasmids carrying um, antimicrobial resistance genes uh, in 21% of our clusters over 550 plasmids. Um, and it's also worth noting here that um, AMR carrying plasmids were present in about two thirds of, of AMR carrying cluster plasmids. Uh, 
And this really highlights that the AMR genes are not necessarily widespread on genetically similar plasmids, um, potentially owing to, to transpose on action. Um, and this is why potentially plasmid studies should ideally consider uh, the entire plasmidome of the niche in question, not just the resistant plasmids or resistant isolates. Um, but this figure here at the top um, summarizes from the previous slide the, the 69 10 plus member clusters decreasing in size. Um, and what we see is again, this kind of um, range of, of compartmental representation, um, but we also see they re represent a range of, of bacterial hosts, um, of mobilities, lengths, replicon haplotypes, and, and of course, resistant profiles uh, here colored by beta lactamase and non-beta lactamase carriage. Uh, and these clusters tend to have, have high purity with respect to these metadata uh, as the often single color bars below these clusters represent. Um, but what we really wanted to do was examine the, the genomic structure of these plasmid clusters. Um, so as I mentioned a minute ago, we, we did a pangenome style analysis of these clusters using Panaru. And this pulled out a set of core genes from each cluster. So these are genes which almost all plasmids shared. Uh, they include proteins for replication, um, mobility, establishment, um, effectively the core functionality necessary for a plasmid uh, within their niche. And, and though importantly, it is probably actually important to mention that though often these genes did align with, with, with the functions we would expect, they were not restricted by functionalization. They were rather just agnostically chosen at a 95% threshold. The remainder, um, the accessory genes, were often niche adaptations, the antimicrobial resistance genes we saw above, um, virulence traits, heavy metal cassettes, toxin antitoxin systems, and so on, the kind of added flavor within this, this putative plasmid backbone. Um, and the bottom panel here shows us somewhat um, the number of core and accessory genes per plasmid cluster in orange and blue, respectively. Um, the core genes on average comprise a median of around 40 odd percent of the total cluster pangenome size. And, and thankfully pangenome size was also significantly correlated with plasmid lengths. Um, so very, very open pangenome by the looks of things. Um, so then again, as I mentioned earlier, we reproduce phylogenies of these concatenated core genes. Um, so here's an example. Um, this is a core gene phylogeny for cluster 35. Um, this is a group of conjugative, beta lactamase producing I2 type plasmids found across human, cattle, pig, and sheep compartments. Um, the tree to the left was produced in, in IQ tree uh, with alignments by MAFT uh, by concatenating the, the 50 core genes in the cluster. Uh, that's those found again within 95% within of the plasmids, uh, which for a cluster this small is, is in effect just 100%. Um, and then the heat map to the right represents an average ordering of the cluster gene repertoire. So we've colored them by core, accessory, or, or transposes. Um, and this quite clearly shows the, the putative persistent backbone structure within the cluster upon which accessory genes are, are gained or lost. Um, if we now color the tips by E. coli sequence type, we also see that these, these interrelated large plasmids are found on a variety of lineages. Um, so this plasmid is not linked also to, to a clonal isolate. Um, also, um, and especially looking at other um, pangenome heat map phylogenies yesterday, you might notice that the, the, the cofinetic distance of the plasmid core genes uh, alongside the, the, the accessory patterns to the right, we can often see concordance. That's to say that clades seem to kind of match up with the heat map. Um, and we plotted this relationship. Um, so here we have along the x-axis, the core gene cofinetic distance. And on the y-axis, we have the jacquard distance of accessory gene presence and absence. Um, and what we see is that the low core gene distance and, and high accessory gene distance is more common uh, then the high core gene distance and the low accessory distance is kind of nether zone to the bottom right. Uh, and perhaps the interpretation here is, is how the plasmid backbone evolution is, is our slow, our slow march. Uh, and then the accessory gene gain or loss is kind of our fast, uh, fast signal. Um, and this may give some clues as to, as to how um, plasmid evolution could be modeled. Um, yesterday, we, we started with Amin mentioning kind of traditional phylogenetic models. And then towards the end of the day, Liam was, was discussing structural, discrete genetic gains, losses, and rearrangements. Um, so perhaps um, 
any model of, of plasmid evolution should reconcile this this slow march of the plasmid backbones alongside the discrete changes in accessory function. Um, and of this pattern, we, we indeed found the same for other clusters here with at least 50 accessory genes. Um, and again, we see these kind of nether zones to the bottom right, this, this trend persisting of this slow core evolution versus this fast gene accessory change. Um, so maybe I'd like to finish with a more with a more concrete example instead of these kind of high level overviews. Um, so here is another um, example within cluster 10. Um, and this is a group of, of resistant, again, conjugative F-type plasmids, uh, many of which are carrying multidrug resistant efflux pumps. Um, and I just want to draw attention to a simpler example of, of uh, plasmid evolution of, of stable backbone and accessory movement across human and non-human compartments, uh, specifically revisiting that example way back from the start of our near identical BSI and cattle plasmids. Um, with the addition of a soil plasmid from near a poultry farm. So this here is an alignment of those three plasmids using clinker. Um, the top two cattle and BSI plasmids are about five snips apart, uh, but the poultry plasmid at the bottom, uh, if this will move again, there we go, uh, features the relocation of this insertion sequence of this ISK PN37 downstream. Um, and it also features might take a couple of seconds. It's quite a long plasmid. It's about 105,000 base pairs. Um, it also features the addition of this um, transposase and this, this hypothetical protein. Um, so this is a very, very simple example of how rearrangements and genes, gains and losses form a main path of, of plasmid evolutionary history. Um, and it also shows how similar plasmids appear to be evolving between human and non-human compartments. Um, and so to bring kind of everything together, um, our data doesn't capture much sharing of near identical plasmids between human and non-human compartments. And really what we do have are just well-conserved, quite prolific cold types. Um, but what it does give is a kind of a body of evidence for more intertwined, complicated evolution, where similar plasmids differ by a handful of accessory genes. Um, I would also like to emphasize a point I made earlier, and that's that Resistance plasmids are often part of a far broader plasmidome of, of very similar but non-resistant plasmids. Uh, and as such, it makes, to me anyway, much more biological and, and ecological sense to study the whole population when possible. Um, our next steps with the study are to try and date these events. Uh, we've had a, had a, a go, uh, a very limited go with, with using IQ tree. Uh, with preliminary findings showing some divergences of, of human and non-human resistant plasmids within recent years or decades. Uh, but this is very much uh, a methodology which needs refining. Um, so I'd say thank you to my, to my supervisors, uh, Sarah, I think Nicole and Liam are here today, uh, Dan Reed from the CH, Derek Crook, uh, other people in my lab, Sam Bead, and of course everyone from the APHA who allowed us to, to sample their farms, so Luna Manal, uh, Richard, uh, everyone at APHA. Um, thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much. That was a great way to start the day or the afternoon. Um, do we have any questions from anyone uh, up front? Let's just check, check. So I, I did raise my hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe no. you don't see me. No, I didn't. Um, Go ahead. I really enjoyed your talk a lot. Uh, I was just curious in your environmental uh, collection of isolates. Do you also have uh, isolates with plasmids coming from uh, produce or vegetables? Uh, that was not collected as part of. So this this is effectively an algo, uh, uh, an amalgamation of two separate studies. So mm -hmm. this a BSI study led by Sam Lipworth and, and others in my lab. Uh, and then the rehab project, which is uh, kind of spearheaded by Nicole and others. Um, mm -hmm. Vegetables were unfortunately um, out of the scope. Um, which is, which you will hear in my talk, uh, because I'm reporting about mm. E. coli carrying plasmids uh, uh, coming from lettuce and cilantro mm. and so on. And it was quite interesting to see uh, that we have quite a high diversity of these type of plasmids. Uh, in uh, E. coli from 
uh, cilantro, for instance. And obviously, this could be a very nice link mm. from the environment to humans via the gut microbiome. Definitely. It's, it's all about trying to kind of postulate on those links within, yes. within the, the One Health Network. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, Thanks very much, Cornelia. Um, I'm going to quickly ask one question that's uh, sitting in the um, uh, in the chat, Will, um, from Sonia Leighton. She said, thanks for the great talk, Will. You touched on this a little uh, at the end a little bit, but I was wondering whether you could say more about what slow and fast mean in the context mm. of plasmid evolution. Is it possible to put some estimates on what these rates are? Uh, as for rates for, for the, for the um, core genes, we can uh, extrapolate the, the, the number of substitutions uh, per base from 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 um, the ml tree um, as for as for the kind of the accessory genes which are moving through generally through through transposons and stuff that's that's probably far far harder to characterize and then it's probably more of a job for the experimentalists um, or for far far larger data sets um, but what we do certainly see is is different um, insertion elements moving between um, different kind of fixed backbones uh, within the data set. Okay, uh, I think that question of rates is going to come up again and again this week. Um, we have another question from Ambrin Kauser, but we're already five minutes overdue. So I'm sorry, Ambrin, we're going to save that for the discussion later. But we'll feel free to answer on the chat if you want.